a bus ride of pure terror. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. I'm going to talk about the Greyhound Bus 1170. And that is where the on the Trans-Canada Highway... 19 miles west of Manitoba, this bus, 1170, was the notorious site of the gruesome stabbing, beheading, and cannibalization of the 22-year-old man, Tim McLean. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's going to get dark, and it's going to get dark I don't think we've ever almost had a, immediately. a location that was on it's a, a mo- moving, moving location. Lo- wow. Yeah, we're breaking new ground. We're breaking. We're pioneers. We're very brave. <laughs> revolutionaries yeah. but this is one of those things where and i as you probably know i consume a lot of true crime yeah and a lot of history but this one has stuck with me because the visuals of it are so haunting and we're going to talk about the people who are involved and how they all have like horrific ptsd but even just knowing about this case so again this is not safe for work Play, I hit the explicit fewer. on the, uh, yeah. on the rating, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. The explicit is, um, is, that, is it, amped up. Yeah. It's turned the fuck up. Yeah. So get ready because it's going to be a wild ass ride. But before we get into that, let's give you a little breather and let's talk about what's kind of happening yeah. right now. Like, right? What's going on? I what's am the traveling. buzz? Yeah. I'm traveling uh, for work to next month to Las Vegas and to Austin. I've never been to Austin. Have you been to Austin? I did. I did a, an improv uh, festival there. Oh. oh the Out of Bounds. Yeah. Okay. We were, we were talking about maybe. Maybe trying to get over there. Yeah. For a podcastery. Yeah. We're going to, um, we're going to, you know, we have the show in LA, as you know. As we're you look, know. We're looking to, um, we're actually looking to do a, f- a festival in Canada. <laughs> I can't wait. I mean, again, uh, I'm fascinated see, yeah, by it. I just yeah. don't like when people are like Canada is like a utopia, and it's like it's not. Yeah, just wait. Um, but yeah, I would love. I'd love to. Any recommendations about Austin it would be very welcome. I'm really excited to go there. Um, I'm working on the show that I'm working on, Brain Games. Um, some segments there, so I'm gonna eat barbecue and hopefully see some spooky ass things. And Vegas too, of course. Uh. I've been to Las Vegas, but. Man, oh man, I can't wait. It's on someone else's dime. It's yeah, like a it's different. Yeah, it's just the sweetest. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure I'm going to be staying like some like Holiday Inn Express or I was waiting, shit, I, I wanted to ask, you know? but maybe I'll ask off off record where uh, you're staying. I don't know yet, so I can't answer that. Yeah. But I'm sure it's like some whatever low grade thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be really fun. I can't wait to see cool stuff there and talk to you guys about it. But again, I as much as I've been to Vegas, which is a handful of times, I love recommendations. Same thing with Austin. Never been there. Would love all of the recommendations. I can recommend it. I don't know if you've been there. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you ever talked about it on here, but the Neon Museum. Oh, yeah. Where, I don't know if you've been. Have you been? It's, uh, I've, never, I've never been. It's pretty cool. It's all mm-hmm. the Las Vegas, old Vegas, like neon signs. Cool. And like a graveyard. Of neon. They give a little tour. It's amazing. I, okay. At night, there's and it's hot at night too, depending on when you go. And it uh-huh. might be hot when you're when you're there. Yeah, it's um, be but it is. Uh, it think it's better at night because okay. Vegas is nightlife, baby. You know yeah, what I mean? All the nightlife. Uh, yeah, yeah ooh, get it. It's like get 10 it. p.m. in bed by 10:45. Ooh, ooh, party time. animal. <laughs> yeah. Good night. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I, I, if anyone's out there, and it, probably already heard about the Neon Museum, but um, okay, check it out. I will check that. Yeah. And one thing I've also checked out, which I think I'm late to the party. I definitely am. Is uh, the Netflix documentary "Abducted in Plain Sight"? Yeah, I want to say a little bit about that because I watched it last night. I watched it. I mean, I was a little later than some people, but I watched it a while ago. But only because uh-huh. so many people were talking about yeah. it, yeah, and how ridiculous it was, and how frustrated they were, yeah, and how. But it just goes to show, like everyone is clueless, like how clueless people were, um, 30, 40 years ago about mental health, sexual yes. predators. Um, Appropriate contact between an adult and a child. I mean, religious oppression. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a huge one. Yeah, Yeah. the way that this poor girl was uh, oppressed um, and suppressed. We I don't want to give too much away in case people haven't watched it. Yeah, but but it's so long. But I also hate you know it's like how when did it come out? I'm late to it. Uh, No, I mean it came out in the last few months. I guess so. Four months. That's in true crime time. That's like forever. Twenty five years ago. It's aged out. And it's also one of those things like you're watching it and you're Mm. like. The fact that it's so bizarre in the first mm-hmm. few minutes, yeah. and you're like, I know this is going to even get weirder. Because they usually yeah. don't get to that part till oh later. It, it's like a complete weirdo thing in, in 15, mm-hmm. 20 minutes. You're like, oh, I know there's more. Yeah. You're like, this is, yeah, this is just a taste of what's to come. And 
also, I mean, I just think we're not going to get stories like that anymore. Yeah. These isolated people. Or the stories are out there and we just, someone hasn't, I a guess. producer hasn't found them. I yeah. just think with the digital age, like, you can't convince someone that they're no. getting abducted by aliens. Sure, right sure, now. sure, yeah. You know, like, I, and that's a little bit of a spoiler, uh, but the, the amount of isolation that made this possible is mind-boggling. Yeah. And I'm sure this guy, I mean, there's a million stories out there that mm-hmm. uh, I think, that I think as, as uh, you know, people like listening to podcasts, maybe like this one or, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, into documentaries and true crime, I feel like people are out there seeking these things. Like, they're like, mm-hmm. there's more out there. And as a producer or as a whatever, mm-hmm. I want to find those, yeah, find those stories. Them up. In yeah. fact, my, uh, so I work in the same office as Cold Justice and my, so across the, workspace is this woman and she's like always on the phone with different sheriffs and deputies and she's like how many stabbings 14 stabbings or 13 stabbings yeah. like they're always she's don't talk to me unless it's she's 25 that person, yeah. exactly who's like uh it can't be they can't be a lifetime cr- criminal it has to be like a crime of passion mm. like she's she's the one that's like weaseling her Make way around trying to find those cases yeah. um which is probably my dream do- yeah. job i guess um but let's get back to another brutal case yeah and let us know what you think of abducted in plain sight now six months from now four years from now sure, sure. yeah we're not on a schedule or a timeline yeah. so you well before be. before you do that mm-hmm. um you know we have a patreon yeah. we got bonus episodes up the wazoo bone ep waz uh for two dollars a month you get all those bonus episodes whoa and then for twenty five dollars, you could get mentioned and your website mentioned your on an episode. Your website, you work so hard. Or on that. message, you know, or message, or message, or whatever it is you if want. If you want to propose over our podcast, yeah. we would embrace it. Yeah, and if, if and you're, we're sorry, and if you're a significant <laughs> other listens to this show, I was like, maybe shouldn't, maybe they are not the one for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, just like, just but let at least you know that. have them written review. Yeah, you uh, know. But patreoncom slash Yes, check and it out. Ghost Town Pod at Gmail for any questions, comments, whatever. But well, let's get back to Canada, shall we? Oh, you know what? Canada? I can go there. I'm just, you know, just going to go to Canada. Just right now. Right now. Yes. I'm going to take you there and you're going to wish you had it. Oh, boy. Okay. So uh, this is also very recent, too, which I appreciate. Um, mm-hmm. At 12.01 p.m. on July 30th, 2008, Tim McLean, who was born on October 3rd, 1985, he's a Libra. Um, is that significant or is that just no, your, that's just you're just going to ask for log- logical on us here? Yeah, just a little, just if, if it gives you context, great. 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 He was a carnival barker, um, which was someone who would promote carnivals with like flyers and stuff. We got um, all the freakies. Yeah, we got the freaks. We got the <laughs> ski ball. We got the world, tilt a whirl. That was him. Um, and he was, he was 22. He was returning home to Manitoba after working a fair in Alberta. So he departed Edmonton on board the Greyhound bus 1170 to Winnipeg via the Yellowhead Highway through Saskatchewan. And we don't know, I don't know a lot about him, to be honest. I was digging, there's a lot known about um, another person in the story, but there's really not. He was just a young kid, um, you know, pretty, like, loved, kind, pretty chill. Doing his um, thing. Doing his thing, just trying to get home, you know? Um, at 6.55 p.m., the bus departed from a stop in Erickson, Manitoba, where a new passenger, Vince Y. Guang Lee, uh, boarded the bus. Lee, described as a tall man in his 40s with a shaved head and sunglasses, originally sat near the front of the bus and kind of confused, panicked. Um, onlookers were saying he was kind of pacing. Uh, he had a problem. He English was not his first language. Mandarin was. So he had a problem communicating, um, which is a part of his history that we'll get into. Uh so he was sitting in the front of the bus and he moved uh, to the back of the bus where McLean was sitting right next to, you know, that uh, row that's kind of longer next to the bathrooms on the back of a Greyhound bus. So he was sitting there yeah. and Lee sat right next to him. McLean barely acknowledged Lee and then fell asleep against the window pane, headphones covering his ears. So here's a little background on Vince Lee, which we have a lot more on him. He was born in uh, Liang, China on April 30th, 1968. From 1994 to 1998, he worked in Beijing as a computer software engineer. He was uh, trained in software engineering, and he immigrated to Canada from China in 2001. He became a citizen shortly after that, and the psychiatrist Stanley Yaron, who later examined Lee, said that he was hospitalized in 2003 or 2004 after an incident with the provincial police. But that was the only thing that ever signified that maybe anything was amiss with him. He worked in Winnipeg at menial jobs at a memorial church for six months to support his wife. He had a wife which, who barely gets mentioned in any of this, thank God, I think. Um, 
Pastor Tom Castor, Pastor Castor, who employed Lee, said he seemed happy to have a job and was committed to doing it well, despite a language barrier with other congregation members. I think you would occasionally feel frustrated with not being able to communicate or understand, Castor told CTV Winnipeg, but we have a very patient staff and he seemed to respond well. Castor also said Lee didn't show any signs of anger issues or trouble before he quit in the spring of 2005. He also worked as a forklift operator in Winnipeg while his wife worked as a waitress. All right, so it's, you know, it's... It's, uh, it's just uh, an immigration story yeah. about someone making their way in a new country, right? He moved to Edmonton in 2006, left his wife alone in Winnipeg. He uh, worked at a Walmart, at a fast food restaurant, and newspaper delivery, and his delivery boss said he was reliable, hardworking, and not showing any signs of trouble. So we're just really setting the scene. Um, four weeks before he boarded this bus, though, he was fired from Walmart following a disagreement with other employees. Shortly before the incident, Lee asked for time off from his delivery job to go to Winnipeg for a job interview. So transitioning. But again, the worst that we've seen is yeah. irritability. Um, not quite Seems getting what you want. T- Disagreement. T- typical, you know, maybe some people, nothing too right? crazy or nothing too crazy. So let's get back to the bus, though. So the bus had 34 passengers and they as they neared Manitoba, they were watching the return of Zorro on the bus screens. According to Stephen Allison, an 18 year old who was riding the bus with his new wife, Isabella, um, and he was riding right next to Lee, um, like he could reach out and touch him if he wanted to. McLean was sleeping with his headphones in, and suddenly Lee produced a large knife and, without emotion or feel m- fear, mechanically began stabbing McLean in the neck and chest. Allison screamed for the driver to stop, and everyone started running towards the front. Allison's wife, however, was so like in like survival mode, she was paralyzed with fear. So Allison had to go back as Lee was stabbing him back to literally they were maybe three feet apart grab his wife, and take her out of the bus. The bus driver pulled to the side of the road so that he and the other passengers could exit the vehicle. The attacker, Lee, then decapitated McLean and displayed his severed head to the other passengers who were standing outside at this point. The driver and two other men had attempted to rescue McLean but were chased away by Lee, who slashed at them from behind the locked bus doors. There was a second Greyhound bus trailing the 1170, and the driver, who who had been a driver for 35 years, named Bertie Skyrup, saw 1170 veer off the road and calmly pulled his bus in front of that bus. He, he went onto the bus and called out to the man, Lee, in the back of the bus. Lee stopped hacking at Mr. McLean's le- neck long enough to look up and say, get emergency. It was then that Mr. Skyrup realized that the deranged man was essentially just like severing a body that had already been killed and was not in his right mind. He immediately left the bus and Lee went back to McLean's body and began severing other parts and consuming some of his victim's flesh. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So let's take a little break there for you to process that. All right. And we're going to come right back. Okay. So what is... Uh, this is so... Yeah. Oh. I know. You, know, I, you know, I suppose that is it, is it worse uh, when you hear, like, these things? Like, when you hear the... Like, oh, you know, he was a very threatening worker, or is it is it worse when there's no sign? I know. Really, I think it's creepier when there's no sign. sign I, think, yeah. I mean, it's all really disturbing. Yeah. But I think when the, when the idea of someone just being able to like like switch something on and off is profoundly yeah. scary. So there, okay. So so Lee is dead. He is. And what year? Pulp. What year are we in? What, what are we? Two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Okay. Um, Uh, We have Lee, who's still hacking at McLean's body in the bus. Everyone is off the bus. The bus driver is barricading the door so he can't get off the bus. And they're all in the middle of nowhere. At 8.30 p.m., the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Mounties to the rescue, in Portage La Prairie, received a report of a stabbing on a Greyhound bus west of the city. They arrived to find the suspect, Lee, still aboard the bus, being prevented from escaping by another passenger, the bus driver, and a truck driver. This is also really scary. You're not trying to get away from someone. You're holding them in. Yeah. You know, um, and another truck driver who had seen them and had provided a crowbar and a hammer as weapons. So it was just like this crew of people. The other passengers were huddled on the roadside, some of them crying and vomiting. As the uh, yeah, I mean, like, right? I, it's like I don't blame anybody for like, doing whatever they're doing. Exactly, because. exactly. Um, 
So he had Lee had attempted to escape by driving the bus away, and the driver had engaged the emer- emergency immobilizer system, rendering the vehicle inoperable. Witnesses had observed the subject stabbing and cutting McLean's body and carrying his severed head around and like parading it around, showing people. But he said, "Get emergency!" Like, does yeah. that mean the police or? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not in his right mind, yeah. but like, yeah, who knows? Who knows what it means? Um, by 9 p.m., the mounted police were in standoff with Lee and had summoned special negotiators and heavily armed tactical unit. Lee was, again, pacing the bus like an animal. Like, can you, I can't even imagine. It's just, it's, the scenario is insane. And he continued to defile the corpse, quote unquote. Police officers then observed Lee eating parts of the body. Meanwhile, the stranded passengers were transported from the scene to be interviewed at the Brandon RCMP detachment, um, which is just a place where they could, like, get their druthers, take their full report. Um, RCMP officers reportedly heard Lee say, I have to stay on the bus forever. Oh, right? Boy. I know. On July 31st, 2008, at 1.30 a.m., Lee attempted to escape from the bus by breaking through a window. The RCMP arrested him soon afterwards. He was shot with a taser twice, handcuffed, and placed in the back of a police cruiser. Parts of the victim's body placed in p- plastic bags were retrieved from the bus while his ear, nose, and tongue were found in Lee's pockets. Um, the public were very critical of the RCMP who wondered why the, like nobody boarded the bus. Um, it, the officers at no time entered the bus, which is, I, again, it's interesting um i certainly i wasn't there and i can't imagine it but also like there's more of them they have weapons i don't know i don't know there's a, there's a lot of procedural things that we'll get into in a bit where you're like why did that happen what's going on um uh mclean's eyes and his heart were never recovered and are presumed to be to have been eaten by lee at 10 a.m. the next day, Greyhound representatives took the other passengers to a local store to replace their clothes, which remained on the bus. They arrived in Winnipeg at 3.30 p.m. to be reunited with their family members and friends. Sigh of relief. Um, immediately, Lee had a trial on March 3, 2009, with Lee pleading not criminally responsible, um, a.k.a. the insanity plea defense. Um, he accepted that he was not of the right mind, uh, the psychiatrist said that Lee performed the attack because God's voice told him McLean was a force of evil and was about to execute him. So again, the emergency thing maybe has something to do with that. Who knows? The presiding judge, John Scurfield, accepted the diagnosis and ruled that Lee was not criminally responsible for the killing. Lee went to the Selkirk Mental Health Center, but during the trial repeatedly he asked the court to please, please kill him. The week following the attack, Greyhound Canada announced it was pulling a series of nationwide advertisements, which included the slogan, there's a reason you've never heard of bus rage. Timely. (laughs) The incident had led to numerous calls and petitions demanding increased security on on all of the buses in Canada. The family of Tim McLean naturally brought a lawsuit of $150,000, not much, against Greyhound, right? Um, the Attorney General of Canada and Vince Lee. Um, and then a couple of passengers also uh, filed a lawsuit against Lee, Greyhound, the RCMP, Governments of Canada for being exposed to the beheading. They were seeking millions of dollars in damages, which seems more appropriate, but two of the women dropped the lawsuit. Um, so then we go from like 2010 to around 2015, and Lee is slowly, he's in this facility, but gaining more rights to, at first, Um, outdoor walks, right? Then um, temporary passes that allow him out of the center to visit the town um, with an officer. He uh, would be allowed to have unsupervised visits then. Then he would do um, go to the beach, things like that. So all of this is happening. All of this is happening. Um, But before we get to what happens to him, I just want to talk about the people who were on the bus, the other 32 people. Literally everyone on this bus had PTSD. Yeah. Really bad. Suffered from depression, alcoholism. Um, multiple times there were quotes of, I just can't get the screams out of my head. One of the passengers even gave up a, a newborn, she had a baby, to social workers because she had so much PTSD from her attack that she couldn't, she felt that she was unfit to be a mother. Um, after a year, she got her child back and, and resumed taking care of it. Um, but very sadly, on July 17th, 
2014, the Toronto Sun reported that one of the first officers on the scene, Corporal Ken Barker of the RCMP, committed suicide. The family stated that his obituary, that he was suffering from horrible post-traumatic stress disorder from that incident. Who expe- like who's prepared for that? You right. Know? Um, so back to Lee. In February 2016, it was reported that he had legally changed his name to Will Baker. Oh. Yeah, a trustworthy, <laughs> trust, trustworthy sure. uh, Will Baker, yeah. Yeah, just uh, also like the whitest name yeah. ever. And won the right to live alone in February uh, on February 26th on the recommendation of the Criminal Code Review Board. On February 10th, 2017, the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board ordered Lee an absolute discharge with no legal obligations or restrictions pertaining to Lee's independent living. So he's out. He's living under this name. And then um, on Facebook, uh, the mother of Tim McLean, yeah. she just put, I have no words. I mean, that is... How do you, I mean, you, you know, there's people in prisons that have like. For selling weed. Yeah. Okay. Like for a white collar crime that yeah. will stay in prison forever. Yeah. But this person, it's like, it's so interesting. And again, it is a testament to our, I'm not saying, a testament to like how we deal and don't deal with men- mental health yeah. issues and how our system processes people with extreme mental health in our system. Canada's system, probably our system too, um, issues in that vein, but also like just the idea of you having a kid who was brutally murdered, uh, and eaten by someone and they are just walking around like going shopping and driving to their jobs every day. Yeah. With no, I mean, do you even have to tell like, Oh, Hey, I've, uh, you know, when you fill out a job application, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Is it just like, no, and you're like, Oh, you got to admit it. <laughs> yeah. Well, or I don't know. Maybe if it's, if it's, if you're discharged without ever, you know, do you have to disclose that information? So you're pretty much, you yeah. had a, like you had a free stay at a, you know, and you listen, if you're, you know, I believe in, you know, rehabilitation, but like there's gotta be, I mean, I don't know like what, and, and I did do some research cause I, there's not a lot of really in-depth testimony from the people that were there like i was hoping to find like a you know like an interview or record nobody people have like a couple sentences and that's it um and i and about and he doesn't have any testimonies either it's mostly like his doctors uh psychiatrist being like he is heavily medicated and he has been heavily medicated for a very long time so he can exist in the world and it's like yeah i mean okay like i guess that is what it takes to make this guy a contributing member to society. But does he deserve that right? Yeah, because so many people were... It's not just, oh, I only killed and ate one person. It's yeah. like you've traumatized... Yeah. Other lives were permanently affected yeah. and lost, too, yeah. which is also in- profoundly sad. Yeah. And this this person is just like, I was just had to take a break from living a normal life. Yeah. Like I, I, six months where I went crazy. Yeah. And then I got to chill. I know. I know. And I know it, we're diminishing sure. the reality of that. But also, like, it is so hard to fathom someone who's alive and living their lives who has done something that atrocious. Where is other people... Mental break have, or not. Yeah. Whereas other people have done things that, you know, are questionably criminal or whatever yeah and have very very strong sentences oh uh, too too strong yeah. i mean i again i it's so hard i i just feel like the way we deal with criminality is so yeah. skewed yeah that's funny right yeah that that's fun right that's a that's, fun that's a ending. fun uh, i wish i had like you had a fun like ending to yours but greyhound bus 1170 i mean i just hope that they're someone like really st- steamed wash power wash that bus and it's just taking some kids to birthday parties or being yeah, used I, well, as a I, I, if that bus still in circulation bus. i'm sh- i mean are people can you how would you even like i don't know, I, I try to look up the bus specifically there's yeah. there's actually not really much on this aside from the facts is there like a ton of photo is there any, any oh crime? yeah there's photos and there's footage of at the site but not because the, the uh, cell phones were like up and running and yeah. 2008. You know. Yeah. Although, again, it was a really rural highway, which you'll see in some of the pictures. Yeah. Which makes um, it more terrifying. Yeah. Whereas it was it was here, I think everyone would be taking video and stuff. Yeah. But it's still yeah, I mean, point. there's no way this is not going to be some kind of movie mo- based on something. Right? It's oh going to happen. Terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. Damn. I know. Ouch. I know. I think I need a glass of wine.
Hey, I'm Chris. I'm Masoo. And I'm Suze. And we're here from Mystery on the Rocks, a podcast all about cocktails and mysteries. Seeing as you're already loving a Studio 71 podcast, we thought you'd like ours too. Each week we invite someone hilarious from the world of show business to come into our bar, which is definitely not a studio, and we solve, well, try to solve, an unexplained mystery. We also drink cocktails because every good studio bar serves up cocktails. And this is definitely a bar. Not only does Suze help crack the case, she also plays the piano. Yes! So why don't you come and join us? You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all your favourite podcast apps. Just search for Mystery on the Rocks.